All right, well, welcome to week 12. Um, I'm just gonna throw the uh, calendar up here to remind us this Thursday is exam four. So the practice will close tomorrow. And then next week on Tuesday, we actually don't have any new material, okay? So this is really a catch-up week next week and with the holiday. So if I don't see you on next Tuesday, that's fine. Uh, but if you have questions, that's a good day to pop in with any questions. We can review anything, um, especially, you know, before the final coming up. But otherwise, you guys get some rest. And me too. Me too. Um, yeah. And I really hope you guys have a great holiday. So that's the dealio. And we are wrapping up chapter five today. Okay. All right. So 5.4 is on indefinite integrals, like we kind of mentioned last time, and the net change theorem. So recall that the integral of little f of x gives you some function big F. And so that means that the derivative of capital F is small f. Okay, and we have to make sure now with indefinite integrals that we add the constant of integration, just like we did when we were finding antiderivatives. So for example, the integral of x squared dx is x cubed over three plus c. And so the c now, it's called the constant of integration. Right, and this is true because, let me do that in blue. When you take the derivative of x cubed over three plus c, right? You bring the three down, it cancels, and then you reduce one from the power, you get x squared. The derivative of the constant is zero, right? So the derivative gives you back that integrand. And again, we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus that differentiation and integration are inverse property uh, processes. So let's see some more. How about if you want to integrate the eighth root of x to the ninth? So we can write this using a power as x to the nine eighths. And now when you integrate that, you're gonna add one to the power. So I'm gonna add one as eight eighths. So that gives us 17 eighths and you divide by 17 eighths plus a constant. Right. When you divide by a fraction, you invert and multiply. So you get eight times X to the 17 eighths over 17 plus a constant. And I know it looks messy, but there it is. Oh. OK. 
Okay, so some more um, power functions, polynomial functions in the integrand here. Uh, u to the seventh minus two u to the sixth minus u to the fourth plus. I don't know why. I'm sure I copied this from WebAssign, and I don't know why they're saying six thirds rather than simply two. But um, sure. <laughs> so when we integrate, we add one, divide by the new power. I'm going to call that two. And that's it. I don't think there's anything more really to simplify there. And how about e plus seven? times eight u plus five. And notice again, like in this example here that we just completed, how I have parentheses around the entire integrand. Because, you know, the du is operating on all of those terms, not just the last term, right? So with this example, I don't need to because we have you know, two factors and du is multiplying the two factors. So you could put brackets around them, but it's not necessary. And then, you know, I almost feel like, you know, this is the kind of like trick question. Ooh, it looks weird, but you have to just foil it out. And then you get, you know, a basic polynomial function like we've been dealing with. So just foil it. And you get 8u squared plus 5u plus 56u is 61u plus 35. And again, we want parentheses. And now it's just a nice polynomial function. So when we integrate, add 1, divide by the new power. Right, we, you know, again, I think of 35 as 35 times u to the zero, and you add one, so now you actually have a factor of u, and plus a constant. And just from years of even teaching, like, algebra and college algebra, when you, you learn about polynomial functions, and that last term, you know, constant term, you could think of it times x to the zero. All right, how about a secant t times eight secant t plus three tan t dt. And again, there we have two factors, right? The secant is multiplying the parentheses, oh. multiplying the dt. Okay. So I can distribute that secant. And it's customary to leave the coefficients, you know, the numbers out in front. And so the derivative of tan is secant squared. So here I get eight tan t. And the derivative of secant is secant tan. So I get secant t, three times secant t plus the constant. 
All right, so again, remember last time we did the definite integrals, those turned out to be numbers, right? You're not, these, they, you get a new function and there's a constant of integration because when you take the derivative, the derivative of the constant is zero. Um, we don't need to deal with constants with the definite integral. And we just get a number. Common application is the area under a curve. So for example, so just be careful when you're doing these that you check to see whether there are limits and that's what tells you whether you have a definite or an indefinite integral. Right, so this one has limits from zero to pi. So this is a definite integral. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And you can just leave the constant. And the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Because think about it, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So if I want a positive sign, I have to add the negative. And I'm going to evaluate both of those terms from zero to pi. And so again, I recommend, you know, you do one with the pi. And then minus one with the zero plugged in. And for the most part, I would say just, you know, don't try to also do the count, you know, like take a whole separate step just to write it plugged in and then do the arithmetic or evaluation, whatever it's gonna be. So cosine of pi is negative one, cosine of zero is one. So I get four e to the pi plus five then minus four minus five times minus one is plus five. <laughs> this is where I'm most likely to make a mistake <laughs> when I'm adding the numbers together. So it's terrible. So I have four e to the pi and then you have 10 minus four is six. Okay. And I remember as a student, like, you know, kind of getting busted on, ah, I didn't see the limits and I just did an indefinite integral, you know, just silly, but uh -huh. I still remember that. It's funny how some mistakes like last a lifetime. <laughs> it was probably just on a homework too, but but sometimes I feel like when I've made a mistake at something, it helps to prevent me from ever doing it again. You know, maybe not ever, but makes it less likely. Anyway. So the net change theorem. You know, it's basically uh, saying that the integral of, oops, of capital F prime 
is f of b minus f of a. So in other words, the integral of a rate of change gives you a net change. Now, in particular, and anytime I see, you know, like a prime, F prime, I have to say, I mean, the first thing that pops up into my head really is velocity, right? Because, you know, kind of like whenever I see an integral, the first thing that pops in my head is area under the curve. So when I see a derivative, I think of rate of change and our common everyday experience of rate of change is a velocity. And so this is saying, you know, if you integrate a velocity from T1 to T2, this actually gives you a displacement. Right, so some particle or, you know, usually we talk about particles that are moving around. And again, that's all my physics background, but even a car, any kind of an object, right? Um, you're integrating velocity, so you get position and it's the net change in the position, right? So again, you're, you know, you're in your car, you're driving from here down to San Diego, and you start at maybe time zero, and you end up two hours later. So T1 is zero, T2 is two. And you take that velocity, you integrate it, and this gives you your displacement, the like 100 miles. Okay. So it's the difference between, you know, where you ended up and where you started. That's displacement. It doesn't give you the distance traveled, okay? Because, right, and we've seen this before, but just as a reminder, you start here, say in Long Beach, you end up down in San Diego, but maybe you had to pull off the freeway and get gas, or maybe there was some detour you had to go around, maybe, you forgot your sunglasses and you had to come back, <laughs> right? Whatever. So your actual distance traveled is the absolute value. And, you know, whenever I see that, I just always feel like reminding us that the absolute value, you know, it's positive for non-negative values. or It's the opposite for negative values. So let's see an example. The given data is for a particle. Moving along a line. So acceleration is 2t plus 4. Um, initial velocity is negative 32. And we're looking between 0 and 6 seconds. So 
So we're going to um, find the displacement and the distance traveled. So, so we're given the acceleration, but to find the displacement, we know that we have to integrate the velocity. So the velocity, right, it's the integral of that acceleration. So you get 2t squared over 2, so that's just t squared. plus 4t plus c. And then since we know the initial velocity, um, is negative 32, then c is negative 32. So the velocity function, it's t squared plus 4t minus 32. Okay, so again, displacement. Right, we're going to be integrating from zero to six, just the velocity function dt. Don't forget your parentheses, don't be sloppy. Okay, so we integrate that t cubed over three plus four t squared over two. So that gives you two t squared minus 32 t from zero to six. Got a question, Angelica? <laughs> yeah, because I thought we already did that. Didn't we already get the um, F, capital F, the anti integral, the anti, what is it? <laughs> the anti derivative? We did the anti derivative yeah. for the acceleration. Oh, I see. Okay, so we started we with the acceleration. Velocity. Oh, I yeah. see the A now. Okay. Yeah. I know. See one little thing and you stop and like you miss everything. I know what that's like. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> I've been sitting in classes where I am just pondering where did this negative sign come from? And like I'll miss like 10 minutes of the whole lecture. You know, it's terrible. Yes. <laughs> Especially like when you're doing a, you know, a matrix. Do you guys remember doing that in pre-calculus? I think you do mat matrices. There's just so much little arithmetic. And I'm like, you know, professors like on the fifth board, like in these wraparound boards going around the class. And I'm still <laughs> at the arithmetic, you know, the four minus eight plus two. Plus, you know, where did it come from? Anyway. All right, so plug the six in. Okay, 
And you guys are good that, you know, when you put zero in, it's all zero, right? So let's put minus zero. But all right, so it actually, it actually gives us minus 48. Um, and all of a sudden, I happen to know that the units are meters. So again, I, I must have copied this from WebAssign and just didn't write down all the little details in the problem. Apologies. <laughs> okay, and then... Um, Find the distance traveled. So for different distance, remember we have to integrate the absolute value. So the absolute value of t squared plus 4t minus 32. All right, so again, we need to know where that's positive or not negative, right? I always think of um, values as being negative, zero, or positive, right? So if you say not negative, that's zero plus positive or greater than or equal to, right? Which is what, um, how the absolute value breaks down, right? Greater than or equal to zero, you use the positive, if it's less than zero, then you use the opposite. So we have to find, you know, where that function in the absolute value signs, where it's not negative and where it is negative, right? So we can do that sign test. So, you know, find where this equals zero. So it's at negative eight and four. And, you know, one thing you could do also at this point in your careers <laughs> is, I mean, you could graph that function. It's a quadratic function. And we already know it opens upward because the leading coefficient is positive one, right? And it shifted down, et cetera, right? So basically, you know, it looks something like that. So I'm just saying, you know the function is negative between and positive to the left and positive to the right. Now, we only care about from zero to six. Right, we only care about times between zero and six. So, I mean, you can see that the velocity is negative on zero to four. And it's greater than or equal to zero on four to six.
The other thing you can do is that sign test. You know, so I kind of did a little segue there and graphed it, but you know. Um, You know, you get the zeros. And you break it into regions, right? And I always remember calling the regions different letters, you know. So in A, you maybe test, you know, T equals, I'm going to make a round number. <laughs> negative 10, and so you put negative 10 in for T, that's negative, that's negative, a negative times a negative gives you a positive. Now see, all of this like overlooks the fact that we only care about from zero to six, you know what I'm saying? This is why sometimes, like, yeah. But okay, so in, in region B, you would do, you know, something between negative eight and four. So you could do zero. So that's a positive times a negative. That gives you a negative. And then in C, test maybe like five. So that's a positive times a positive that gives you a positive. And then you want to look at, okay, from zero to six. So you're kind of doing that same thing now. You know. I guess maybe you could have done that narrowing down to begin with. And so you end up with, you know, that same thing. So it's negative from zero to four. So remember for the absolute value where it's negative, you're going to take the opposite. So zero to four. You're going to take the opposite of V. And then from four to six, you're going to take just the positive. And add them together. Right, so you're going to take that like negative, you know, and take the opposite of it. All right, so you're gonna, gonna get um, the negative t cubed over three minus four t squared over two plus 32t from zero to four, et cetera. Too hard to write and talk. And then I realized that's a pain. You know, at least this first one, the lower limit is zero. So really, you're kind of evaluating one, two, three things, you know. But you get with the magic of WebAssign 304 thirds meters. So it's a little over a hundred meters. So I won't bore you with the arithmetic there. Is that good though? Um, why were we taking the opposite again? Like taking why the opposite. 
because we have the absolute value of B. So the absolute value, like I wrote here in red, right? The absolute value is positive V when V is greater than or equal to zero. And it's the opposite of V when V is negative. All right, yeah, I got that part, but why do we want it? Because we want to know the distance traveled at the actual distance. The actual Not distance traveled, the exactly. Little part, okay, let's see. Yeah, so that's this part B, finding the distance traveled. Because otherwise, if I didn't have this negative here, you know, that would have given me a negative number. Remember, this is a definite integral. It would have given me a negative number. So we take the opposite of it to give us a positive number because we're adding the whole distance traveled. So otherwise, it's like, oh, you went, you know, negative 20 meters and positive 80 meters. And then it, you know, it sounds like you went 60 meters. But no, the negative 20, it means you went backwards, but you still traveled 20 meters. So we take the opposite. So we always are going to split it into those positive and negative regions and integrate, you know, like so. Okay. That's actually it for 5.4. Um, you know, again, normally in face-to-face -face class, I'd be giving you guys practice problems to work in groups and what <laughs> it just doesn't seem to work well online like that. Um but I do have extra practice problems in the lecture notes if you guys are interested. And, um, but I know everybody probably just goes on and does their homework, right? <laughs> Which understandable, I, mean, I get it. But yeah, so five, five. We'll move on. And I mean, I feel like five four isn't it's a, it's a little anticlimactic at this point. You know, we've already looked at the antiderivative. We've looked at how to do it with the def definite integral, and now it's like, oh, it's the indefinite integral, right? Without the limits, and you add the constant of integration, which we already knew, you know, from taking the antiderivative, and then kind of putting that together with. Um, the displacement. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear you look at the notes, Angelica. <laughs> um, you know, the displacement versus the distance traveled. And we've seen that before too, just, you know, in general. So, so there's not a lot new in 5.4 is what I'm saying. No. Um, 5.5, five, you know, and when I took calculus, um, again, I feel like all of this integral calculus took place in Calc 2, but, you know, again, so long ago. It's like 1988 or something. Um, but I know, I know you will integrate a lot in Calc 2, a lot. Um, and I used to teach this, I used to teach Calc 2 at UCI and they're on the quarter system. And so I do feel like, you know, Calc 1, 2, and 3 might divide in a little different place or something. Because I feel like I started teaching in chapter five at UCI. But, um, but nonetheless, my point is, you know, we've just learned how to integrate like a polynomial function using like that power rule, right? You have like x to the eighth, you integrate, you get x to the ninth over nine, you add one and divide by the new power. 
But much like how we've learned how to take derivatives of multiple functions, um, there is a lot to know about how to integrate and how to integrate lots and lots and lots of different types of functions. Um, so 5.5 looks at a technique called the substitution rule. And this is gonna help us integrate certain integrands, um, like a function like this, which kind of has two pieces, you know, two X times the square root of one plus X squared. And so again, kind of like when we learned how to take a derivative, then, well, what if we had a product of functions? What if we had quotient of functions, right? So we had the product rule, the quotient rule, and then the compositions, and we use the chain rule. Well, this now, it's actually turning out to be the inverse of the chain rule. It's the substitution rule. Um, so as it says here, to find this integral, we use a problem solving strategy of introducing something extra. And that's the substitution with a new thing, a new variable. And so we're gonna change to a variable u. So suppose we let u be the quantity under the square root symbol. Right. So the one plus X squared, we're calling that U. And then the differential of U is DU, which is two X DX. Okay, so now we're gonna substitute, right? the square root of that stuff becomes the square root of u and the two x dx becomes the du. And why do we do that? We do that because, hey, I know how to integrate the square root of u, right? I can write that as u to the one half and then use the power rule, add one, two halves, so you get three halves, divide by the new power, three halves, and you have two thirds, and then plus a constant, and then substitute back, you know, for your X. So this is that idea of substitution, okay? Now this one, of course, worked out really well, like you just happen to have the two X DX there. So we're gonna. What happened see to how... the 2x dx? Why didn't? So, I mean, we just, like on this one, we got lucky. You know, I was able to substitute this for that. And then I guess I could use a different color. You know, this is my U. So I was able to literally transform this into an integral that I know how to integrate. It worked out so nicely. It just worked out so nicely. Okay. But that's not always gonna be the case, right? I mean, what if instead of two X DX, you know, it was like 3x dx or something. So we're going to see like what we can do to change things up so we're still able to integrate. And they're just showing you can check that we have the correct answer by using the chain rule to differentiate. So you take the derivative of this, Right, you bring the power down, that cancels, subtract by one, and then take the derivative of what's inside. So it works, we can always check. In general, this method always works whenever we have an integral that's of this form, 
So f of g of x times g prime of x dx. So again, this is the inverse of the chain rule, right? The chain rule was when you have a composition, right? Times that. So th this really explains, you know, how that chain rule uh, works here. So if the derivative of big F is little f, then when you integrate that big F prime, right, you get big F plus a constant. Because by the chain rule, when you take the derivative of a composition, right, it's the derivative of the outer times the derivative of the inner function. Okay. So this is like what we know because we know the derivative, right? Kind of like we knew, you know, the derivative of secant was secant tan. So if you integrate secant tan, it's going to be secant, right? We know the antiderivative because we know what the derivative is. If we do a change of variable or a substitution, u equals g of x then instead of f of g of x, we get f of u, right? So that was just substituted there. And so it's the f prime of u du. So we're basically rewriting that integral as f of u du. And this is the substitution rule. So if u is g equals g of x is a differentiable function whose range on an interval i is an interval i, and f is continuous on the interval i, then the derivative of f of g g prime is the integral of f of u du. And so this is proved using the chain rule for differentiation. And notice also if u is g, then du is g prime. So one way to remember the substitution rule is to think of dx and du as differentials. So the substitution rule says it's permissible to operate with dx and du after integral signs as if they were differentials. Now, again, and and because you asked something, Angelica, about, you know, ds and delta or dx and delta x. And even though, you know, notice all the language, it's permissible to operate as if they were. So all of our language, like even when we split them up and multiply, you know, we're allowed to do these things in order to kind of solve things algebraically, but it's really a lot more, you know, kind of nuanced and we just haven't gotten there yet in this class, okay? And I always remember like my, even my physics professors hated all that, like, cause it was so mathy, you know? It's like, they just want to use it and get the, the science done kind of. You know, probably engineers do as well. But as, you know, like a math professor really emphasizes those subtle differences. And if you go on in, in math, you know, beyond calculus, um, you start looking at some of those like little subtle differences. Okay. So here's an example using substitution. And basically, you know, I always often think of it as kind of like even using the chain rule, right? Like we know a cosine function is an outer function. And usually speaking, we're going to be substituting it like an inner function, right? Because we don't know how to integrate a cosine of x to the fourth plus two. We know how to integrate the cosine. So let u be the stuff inside. And then, you know, 
its differential du is 4x cubed dx. Then oh, we did if I only differentials too. We did substitution. Sorry? We did that a substitution for differentials too. We we solved for differentials. With you though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um so yeah, you could say, you know, du dx is 4x cubed. And then find the differential of du is 4x cubed dx. And so, you know, you're just missing the, the 4 in there. So the way the book does now, I have to say it's not the way I learned it. You know, you have an x cubed dx. And so they solve for x cubed dx by dividing both sides by four, okay? And that gives you one fourth du. So now they're substituting this with one fourth du. Does that make sense? And the u, you know, is substituted. That's the easier part. Well, because I thought we were adding one and then dividing it, but this we're doing differentials again. That's how I learned how to do it. I I learned how to do it. I think what you mean is look, you know, u is x to the fourth plus two, you know, you let you be that. And so du is four x cubed dx. Now how I would do this is, well, I have x cubed dx, but I need a four. So I would put a four in there. If I multiply by four, I also have to divide by four. And that's how I get the one fourth outside. So I would do one fourth, you know, cos u, and then four x cubed dx is my du. This is how I do it. Most people my age or older <laughs> will do it this way because this is how we learned how to do it. You know, at some point, uh, Stuart changed the dominant method. I mean, obviously they both work fine, but, and to me, this just makes more sense because, you know, I've been doing it this way since 1988. <laughs> it's a long time to be doing it that way. But they're both the exact same. They're, in fact, the first time I saw this, I was like, what? But okay, you know. But then we don't do anything with the cosine. We leave the cosine. As it is. No, we just haven't finished integrating oh, yet. Okay, okay. So this is the, you know, just making the substitution. And then, oh, we know how to integrate the cosine. It's sine. And then you substitute back for u. Okay. Because in the end, I mean, you know, we want our result to be in terms of X. Okay, so it's all well and good with um, indefinite integrals. Now with definite integrals, we have to be careful because our limits of integration are with respect to that differential, right? Like here, when you're integrating from zero to four, you know, that's because X is going from zero to four. So if you're gonna change to U, you have to also change your limits of integration. Words maybe my husband ha has never heard me say, I don't know. Okay, hold on a sec, yeah.
this is actually a good place to take a break anyway, before we start the definite integrals. So let's take a break and we'll come back at um, like 11 after. Okay. Hey, everybody. We're back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, we're doing definite integrals now. So as it says here, there are two methods possible. The first method is not the recommended way. So I'm gonna show this, but I'm just saying like, don't do it this way, okay? Nobody does it this way. So I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> but we'll see how it works anyway. Um, so this first method is, you know, you do the integral and we've already seen how in the previous example with the indefinite integral, you know, how that works. It would be one third u to the three halves. And in this first method, they substitute back the u, you know, first, and then evaluate from zero to four. Okay, and they end up, you know, you put the four in, four times two is eight plus one is nine, nine to the three halves, the two is on the bottom, so that's the square root of nine is three, Three cubed is 27. So you have 27 thirds minus one third is 26 thirds. Another method, which is always preferable, <laughs> is to change the limits of integration when the variable is changed. Okay, so here is the substitution rule for definite integrals. If g prime is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and f is continuous on the range of u equals g of x, then this definite integral where you have f of g times g prime in the integrand from a to b is, you know, the substitution integrand du from g of a to G of B. And we'll, it's easier to see by example, like a lot of this stuff, right? All right. So this is the common way. If you want to evaluate the integral from zero to four, first you do your substitution. You don't just substitute the, you know, you let that be you. I wish they would do it all on one. Um, on one screen. I'm then, still like really lost about the DX and the DU, like what that part actually is and what it's doing. Like so, I know DX I mean, is the change. And then the du, why is why is du just not the chain? Like, you know, it's like a little label you put there, right? That's what I feel like it's been this whole time. Just like this label saying we're doing this thing. And now it's right. got a number in front of it. So I don't understand that. Okay, so really what we're doing, and it is kind of glossed over is, you know, since we're changing from an X variable to a U variable, you know, here we're integrating with respect to X. So here we need to integrate with respect to U. So in order to get a DU, right, you really do U prime because U prime is DU DX. So we're taking the derivative of this with respect to x. And then remember, 
Well, if du dx equals two, now multiply both sides by dx. And du is two dx. So we've just, you know, we've broken up the top and the bottom. And we said, okay, if you want to solve for the du, multiply both sides by dx. So now I have an expression for du. Does that help? I still don't know what the two came from. Is that from the other slide? That's the derivative up here. Oh, I see. Okay, I get that. Yeah. So okay, when you so take the D, derivative, du over dx two. is the derivative of this, and then we will yep. label it du. Okay. And then I I'm solving for just the du. Okay. Uh, another thing I'm having trouble understanding is how come half the time we're doing antiderivatives and right now we're still doing integrals, but we're doing derivatives. So, you know, we're still doing this integral and this is just a, a technique. Like, I don't know how to integrate the square root of blah, blah, blah. Like, I know how to integrate the square root of x dx. Right, because I can write that as x to the one half. I know how to integrate that using the power rule. But I don't know how to integrate the square root of 2x plus 1 dx. So what we do is we let u be the 2x plus 1. Because now I have, you know, the square root of u and I know how to integrate that. But again, you know, going back to your last question, you know, this is integrated with respect to x. If I've changed to u, I have to have a du over here. So how do I find du? I find du dx, and then I multiply both sides by dx. How does that grab you? <laughs> Now, likewise, you know, these limits of integration are with respect to X, right? Again, you think about like, you know, what we started doing when we're integrating, we're like finding the area, you know, so from zero to four, right? We're finding the area under a curve. So this is X going from zero to, zero to four, but what does U go from and to? So if X is zero, U is one. I shouldn't have put little dots there. <laughs> if X is zero, put zero in for X and U equals one. Put four in for X and U is nine. You're muted there. And we really never finished this DX either is a half DU. So I changed from DX to one half DU. So here it is on the next slide. They have the one half du and the u to the half, and they changed the upper and lower limits. So here was a problem in terms of x, and we've changed it all to a problem in terms of u. And we've done this because now I know how to integrate it.
right? So remember, you can take a constant out from the integral and then the twos cancel here and you have one third and then you can evaluate, you know, what they did was they kept the one third out in the front and then they did, you know, nine to the three halves minus one to the three halves. And we get 26 thirds, which is what we got before as well. Okay, and we're gonna do several more examples. Okay, we'll do several more examples. Um, you know, notice we don't go back to an X after integrating. And that's because these limits are for you, right? We're substituting these limits when we evaluate in there for you. We've changed the X limits to U limits, okay? This is the um, preferable way to do it. All right, and then a note about symmetry, and I say a note, but this is one of the most powerful, um, you know, ideas, I think, some of these with integration. Okay, if you have an even uh, function, and f is continuous over negative a to positive a. If f is even and you're integrating from negative a to positive a, it's twice you know, the right half because remember an even function is symmetric about the y-axis. And then if f is odd, that means f of negative x equals the opposite of f of x. So again, I, you know, for part A for even, I always picture a parabola. You know, so the area under the left is the same as the area under the right. So you could take twice the area on the right. For part B. For an odd function, my go-to mental construct is x cubed. Why can't I line these things up properly? <laughs> it's really hard to draw with a mouse. But that's supposed to be a cubic function, people. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Maybe I should do the cubic function first. Okay, there we go. Unbelievable. So again, if you're integrating over a symmetric, you know, negative A to A, this area is negative. This area is positive. They cancel each other out and you get zero. Okay, this idea, I'm telling you, if you go on and take like Fourier analysis and all these other cool things, it just, it comes up all the time. And, you know, you, it's just really handy for your arithmetic and calculations. And so here they're showing, here's an even function, right? Symmetric about the y-axis over negative a to a. So you could integrate from negative a to a, or you could say, look, that's an even function. I'm going to just do twice from zero to A, and that could make your arithmetic easier, right? You know, when you plug in the negative limits, it you know, it just gets messy because you're subtracting and all of that. It's pain in the butt. So this is really nice. This is even nicer. It gives you zero. You don't even have to do any calculations. If you know you have an odd function, the negative area is going to cancel out the positive area. Okay. Um, so here they're just giving an example, right? So when you have a, um, you know, a power function that's even, again, since that's negative two, you can just go from zero to two and take twice of that. And it's nice with a zero. <laughs> so, um, and this is an odd function, symmetric, so you get zero. Okay, so, okay. That's it for the slides. Let's do some examples. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is the substitution rule. If u equals g of x is a differentiable function whose range is an interval i and f is continuous on i, then the integral of f of g, g prime, is the integral of f of u, du. And so u is g of x, and du dx is g prime, or du is g prime dx. Right, by the chain rule, d by dx of f of g it's f prime of g times g prime of x. For heaven's sakes. <laughs> Okay, so just like when we were differentiating, you know, we know how to take the derivative of sine of x, but we don't know how to take the derivative of sine of 3x. We had to use the chain rule, right? It was the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. Same thing when we're integrating. We know how to integrate like sine or cosine, but only of the one variable dx or whatever the variable is. Um, if there's anything else, you have to use the substitution rule. So like the integral of cosine of 3x we have to do substitution. So let u be 3x then du is 3 dx. And I have a dx in the problem, but I don't have a 3 dx. So you can solve for dx. It's 1 third du. So that integral equals the cosine of u times one third du. Right. I replaced the three x with u and I replaced the dx with one third du. Now you can take the one third out and the integral of cosine is sine. In the end, you want to switch back to your x. Okay, so again, the original problem was cos of 3x. If it were just cos of x, dx, you would get sine x plus a constant. But because of that little three in there, we have to use substitution.
Okay, so we're going to substitute for inside, you know, the radical there in the radicand. So let u be x cubed plus 4. And then du is 3x squared dx. See, in the problem, I have x squared dx. So I can solve for x squared dx, divide both sides by 3. I'm going to substitute in the square root for u. So I'm going to write u to the one half. And then times a third du. So again, you can pull the one third out. And then you add one, so you get three halves. Divide by the new power or multiply by the reciprocal. And then plus the constant. So that's two ninths. And then switch back. To X. Is this good or no? I don't understand why we didn't have to use the x squared, or is that why we did that extra set? I don't. So I, so I replaced, see the original problem is all x's, and I want to switch that whole thing to use. I get that part. So the x squared dx I substituted with one third du. I see. Okay, I got that. And then when we and put then the, I, I know how to integrate. Back. Say again. When we put the x's back, how come we didn't? Oh, we don't add the dx. I don't know. I just so feel then, like the two x kind of just disappeared. Is that what's supposed to happen? <laughs> the two x? You mean the x squared? Yeah, I mean x squared. Yeah, that it's part of the. You know, it okay. equals one third du. So I see, and that really is, you know, I see. That's the derivative of, you know, <laughs> of what's inside the radical. So yeah. All right, and then... Wait, can you go up again? I have a question about what happened to the two two thirds, we multiplied it by the one third, and that's why we have two yeah. nines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So notice if I let you be the thing with the higher power, you know, my du, gives me the lower power, which is on the top. So 
So x to the fifth dx is one six du. So I'm literally just substituting I've got one over u and then times one sixth du. So I can take the sixth out and the derivative of one over u is the natural log of u, natural log of the absolute value of u. And then we put the X stuff back in. So we do a change of variable to U, but we get it in a form that we know how to integrate. We integrate and then we switch back to the X. How are we supposed to know this is an absolute value if we're like doing this problem on our, on our own? That is, um, it's on the cheat sheet as a, you know, it's a, a natural formula. log thing. Yeah. It's one of those integrals to okay. know. Uh, Derivatives, derivatives. I remember putting um, something from the book. Oh, here we go. The third one here. And in the book, there's a table of integrals. By the way, so these are some common integrals. I remember I was saying like in Math 70, if you guys go on, um, you're going to be integrating, integrating, integrating. Uh, back in the day, especially, we used to use tables instead of technology, right? And Just pulling up some tables of integrals. There are thousands, thousands. This is a tiny, I just pulled up the first one I saw. There are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of, you know, different integrals. Well, that's from OpenStax from uh, physics. And so the idea is sometimes like, oh, I, I have a radical, you know, 
times an x to the three halves, right? What does that integrate like? I mean, now you can go online and use an integral solver, you know? But um, a bunch of trig function ones, the trig functions with e to the ax, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really crazy though, you know? And so you guys, I'm sure will be using tables in Math 70 and trying to get, you know, your problem to look like a form in a table. You might need to use a substitution, you know, et cetera. But, um, There's all kinds of different images too, you know, with cinches and koshas and blah, 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 blah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, we also saw, you know, the derivative of natural log, you know, um, it, if it was positive, you know, you would get one over X, but otherwise you had to use the absolute values. So anyway, you know, long-winded explanation or simple question. What's new with me, right? No, it was good because now I'll know to look on the <laughs> sheet. Like I finally got used to the sheet for derivatives and the first part of the integrals is using the derivative sheet because I would figure out what it was backwards. And now right. there's a whole other sheet, so. It is, it's pretty handy. I, I think that cheat sheet is the bomb. Oh yeah, and I love my unit circle. I, I, I just take me back to the days when I was learning the unit circle. It was so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Sometimes I worry I'm an imposter and I'm not doing this well and freaking out because next semester it takes 70. And... You know what? Everybody goes through that. I'm telling you. I mean, I mean, I say everybody, you know, there's always like the, the genius, you know, did I tell you about like the 12 year old student who was in my calculus class? <laughs> no. The rest of us were like, you know. And then I saw him later at UCLA and he was already in medical school. Wow. Um, Cause he was walking around wearing, like he might've already, he probably already had his MD, but he was doing like his residency or I was still working on my bachelor's degree. Um, but the, those, you know, those people are few and far between. The rest of us, everybody I knew and you know, you make a lot of friends, talk in class, especially before all the computers, we used to have study groups. Everybody just felt like, like an imposter. Like, even if you got a good grade in a class, you just felt like you didn't really understand the material well. And, um, and I, I mean, I have to say at UCLA, most of the, the teaching was really poor. I think I've mentioned like a typical mean or average on an exam was like 30%. So if you got maybe like 45, you got an A, but you didn't feel like you, you know, you flunked the exam. You didn't feel like you understood anything. Right. So but and the least higher you know, all the class didn't understand anything either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and again, and the one kid, like there was one kid literally also in my in my quantum mechanics class. Like I had an 11 on the exam. That was a B. And the kid got a 96. So, you know, and like my friends got like seven and they were like, how did you get so many points? You got 11. <laughs> Terrible. So, rough. yeah. So, you know, when I went to do my master's at Cal State Fullerton, I remember, um, you know, some of the students in my class and we had like orientation and everything. So, they had done their bachelor's at Cal State Fullerton. So they were talking about like the finals that they had just taken like in spring and now they saw each other in fall, they were starting their master's program together. 
And they were talking about, yeah, dude, I only got like an 82 on that. And I'm like, pardon me, you actually got an 82 on an exam? Like I hadn't heard a number that high, you know? And so I really believe the Cal State schools are, you know, I mean, they really do emphasize teaching more than the UC school, you know, and now all of this is on video on YouTube, <laughs> but it's the truth. And, I, you know, this was a long time ago. Obviously, I'm sure there have been efforts to improve the teaching at the UC schools, especially in the STEM field. But um, I don't know. I've, I've still heard from students. Yeah, not not so much. So, um you know, they have to grade on a curve or everyone's going to fail. But nonetheless, you know, regardless of the UC versus kind of Cal State, you know, effect, you know, you still, you still feel, it took me, it wasn't until my second year of graduate school that I started feeling like I knew something, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it took a long time. And that was me. I'm sure everybody's a little different. But, um, you know, I talked to a lot of people who, like, graduated with their bachelors. No one felt like they they really understood, like, do I have a degree? Like, why? Like, I don't feel like it means anything because I really don't know anything. And, you know, friend who later became, you know, an attorney and friend who's, you know, like an expert in public health. I mean, nobody felt like with their bachelors because, you know, you have to take so many different classes and learn a breadth of knowledge and you just, you know, you're not taking enough classes in any one area yet to really feel like you're learning something that's going to stay with you, you know? In fact, I was kind of reflecting on this, you know, I'm teaching stats and um, I was basically talking about how, you know, it's fine for them to use the formulas because in, in real practice, you would use, you know, you would pull out a book and look at like a methodology and, you know, but mind you, like when I first got my PhD, I had taken so many statistics classes. I felt like kind of an expert and that I could do research and I could choose, you know, a test and a methodology and everything. But I mean, now I teach elementary statistics. I'm not like a researcher who's doing this all the time. So, you know, it's not until you really get some depth in any one thing, I think, that you, you know. So I wouldn't, don't beat yourself up. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Everybody, I think, really struggles through. And hopefully, you know, Hopefully you come out of each class feeling like you kind of learned something, but you know, it's a lot of material. You can't remember it all. So you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like college is just about, you know, sticking through it, you know, like that's basically what your degree is for. Like just showing up and making an effort and then try. So. And you know, the thing is too, like, you know, it's like all the seed, seeds are being planted. You know what I'm saying? You're learning all of these things. You can't remember them all, but you've learned them once. And again, it's, it's you know, I love my analogy of like, you have to meet somebody to, in downtown LA for a meeting. You've never been there before. You have to use your maps or your, you know, your nav on your car or your phone or whatever. And the first time it's tricky what freeway, what's the best way to go. And then they're all the one way streets and you're looking up, you're looking for landmarks. It's the first time is hard. So you want to go maybe an hour early so you can get there on time and park and blah, blah, blah. The next time you go, it's a little better. Like, you know, oh, that was a one way street. I can't turn down there. So I have to go up but, you know, it's not like you've done it every day. It's not until you do it every day. Like, suppose you get a job there. You know, after you've done it every day for like a month, you don't need your maps anymore. You know the best ways to go. And if there's traffic or a red light, you can take a shortcut. That's exactly what it's like when you're learning these things. You know, the first time you see it, it's like you're figuring it out. You've got all your, your help and everything. It's not until you do it over and over and over and over that 
it sinks in and then you start understanding in a different way. It's like, you know, you start really getting kind of a map made in your head of what downtown LA is like, and then it's more useful and, you know, and so now, I mean, and I don't know about you guys, but like I've traveled a lot. So like, I kind of know a little bit of downtown LA, a little bit of like Miami, a little bit of Boston, a little bit of New York, a little bit of Paris, a little bit of London. I'm not an expert in any one of those, but if I go back, then it's easier. And if I go back again, it's easier, you know? So you guys are taking all these classes. When you see it again, it'll be easier. It, it's not like the first time. How you see integration by substitution, it'll be easier than it was today. So that's, I think, the, the thing to keep with you, you know, that it's all good. <laughs> okay, so definite integral now with substitution. And thanks for the thumbs up there, Denise. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> all right. How about the cube root of one plus seven X DX? Okay, so we want to change all of this to use from X's. So let U be the whole thing under that in the radical. And then DU is seven DX. If there were already a seven there, that'd be a perfect substitution, but there's not, there's just a DX. So I'm gonna solve for DX. And then for the limits, you know, when X is one, what is my U? U is eight. And when X is zero, U is one. So now I'm rewriting this whole thing. <laughs> so it's the cube root of U, U to the one third. So you can pull the one seven out, one seventh out. And you're gonna add one. So you get U to the four thirds. And you're gonna divide by four thirds or multiply by three fourths. And you're evaluating from one to eight. So for these numbers here, you get 3 28 So I'm just gonna pull that outside. Because think about, you know, you get 3 eighths times something with the eight minus 3 eighths times, right? So the 3 eighths in both. So you can pull that out. And then do eight to the four thirds. minus one to the four thirds. So that's three twenty eighths, right? The cube root of eight is two and two to the fourth is 16. Are you guys good with that? The cube root of eight is two, and two to the fourth is 16. And then one to any non-zero power is one. So that's 15 times three is 45, 28. 
right? And we wanted a number for a definite integral, right? So I know how to integrate e to the x, but I don't know how to integrate e to the negative x to the 15th, right? <laughs> so that's what I'm going to substitute. Because if I make it e to the u, I know how to integrate that, right? And then du. Bring the 15 down. And what I have here is the x to the 14th dx. So that's what I want to solve for. And then we also need to deal with the limits. So for X is one. So you do one to the 15th, that's one times a negative one is negative one. Uh, zero to the 15th is zero, so you've got zero. So put your new limits, and now you've got e to the u times negative 1 15th du. And you could flip the units and, you know, change the sign. I thought I did it both ways, but I guess not. So you can pull the negative 1 15th out. So you've got e to the negative one minus e to the zero. So that's one over e minus one. And you can distribute the negative one fifteenth. And I'll write the positive one first because negative 1 15th times negative 1 is positive 1 15th. And then minus 1 over 15e. All right.
just wanted to pull up this uh, chapter summary. And again, my, my little scribbly notes, but you know, if nothing else from this class, I hope I, I've encouraged you guys to do this for yourself in your classes, even if your professor doesn't do it. You know, I mean, I think it's really super useful to just, you know, again, it's like looking at that map of downtown. <laughs> it's saying like, what is in this chapter? So we started out with just, you know, that basic idea of an integral. And then we learned the definite integral. Um, and the fundamental theorem of calculus, the, oh, look at the kitty cat. <laughs> um, the two different parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is basically that, you know, integration and differentiation are inverse processes. So if you integrate one way and then differentiate, you're back where you started. And then today we learned, you know, indefin indefinite integrals. It's just the antiderivative and this net change theorem. And substitution. So that's it. I mean, it's a small chapter which is good, right? And it's all kind of more related. <laughs> so, so again, you guys, um, you guys have your exam. You can do it anytime from Thursday to Sunday. It's on chapter five. On Tuesday, it's, you know, it's just catch up week. Okay, we're, we're not starting chapter six until week 14. All right. I mean, if you want to look ahead, you know, some people, so there were times when I wanted to work ahead because I felt too stressed, you know, and if I had the chance, I probably would have done that. But, um, you know, everybody's different. So you can either rest or if you want to look ahead and then when I lecture on it, it's going to seem so much easier. You know, it's all up to you. Um, but I hope you guys have a great holiday. And so I'm not going to see you until next Tuesday. Oh, that'll be before the holiday. If you don't want to come though that Tuesday, you know, it's really just kind of a question and answer. You know, there's no new material. So, okay. All right. Take care, you guys. If I don't see you, have a nice Thanksgiving. How about that? <laughs> Thank you.